For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Welcome to this edition of the People's Health Dispatch. Uh, this is a video interview uh, where uh, I, my name is Kajan Bhardwaj. I'm a lawyer based in India working on uh, trade and health. Uh, and I'll be talking to Mark Haywood, a social justice activist based in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, who's co-founder of the Treatment uh, Action Campaign, as well as head of the AIDS Law Project, which later became Section 27 in South Africa. Uh, and we're going to be discussing what 40 years of AIDS, uh, which many of uh, you know, must have read about in the press, is being discussed in good detail. Um, so welcome, Mark. So yeah, 40 years of AIDS, uh, I mean, we're really marking it because there was a report uh, in June of 1981 uh, of the US CDC reporting five people who had been diagnosed with uh, unusual pneumonia. Uh, of course, we're discussing pneumonia in this pandemic as well. Uh, this was considered the first documentation of HIV and AIDS. Um, I think for us in the global south, the virus came a lot later and the, the havoc that came with it was probably in the following decade in the, in the 1990s. Uh, what the virus brought with it was not just illness and death, it brought stigma, it brought discrimination, it brought violence, and it took a long time to actually outlaw the stigma and discrimination associated with HIV, uh, whether it was in employment or housing, schooling, uh, public access. Mark, I think you were at the forefront of many of those battles dealing with the stigma and discrimination, whether it was in the courtroom or outside the courtroom. Uh, and it would be great to hear from you about what those early years were like and what do you feel has probably changed now? Great. Well, well thanks, Kajal. It's lovely to speak to you. It's June the 16th in South Africa, well, all over the world, which for us is a very historic day because it marks the anniversary of the Soweto uprising in 1976, which uh, began a a struggle and a revolution that eventually brought democracy uh, to South Africa. Uh, yeah, look, I, I became involved with HIV as an activist um, in 1994, in fact, immediately after our first democratic elections. And in those early years, people already knew in South Africa, epidemiologists, people who were doing modeling, that HIV had the potential to become epidemic and to become a massive epidemic in, in South Africa. I remember in 1994, you know, th there was modeling that suggested that up to 5 million people could be infected with HIV. Today, there are 7.5 million people living with HIV in our country. But because of the stigma, there was a silence and there was a fear. And because in the 1990s, of course, we were still mostly in the period where people with HIV were largely asymptomatic. Mm. Warnings about illness, warnings about mortality and death didn't seem to, to take root, to be heeded, because people couldn't see this epidemic that, that we, we said was, was coming. And then later on, by the early 2000s, you know, when a lot of people, a lot of our friends, our comrades, our family members were dying of, of AIDS, Again, because of the stigma, uh, the response of many people was to say that they didn't die of AIDS. It wasn't AIDS. It was because people were bewitched or it was because of tuberculosis or it was because of a whole number of factors. So, so really, you know, in the first decade or 15 years of the epidemic in South Africa, we had a terrible struggle to overcome stigma. And we used several strategies, as you've hinted. Uh, I joined the AIDS Law Project in 1994 with Zaki Ahmad and uh, Justice Edwin Cameron was, was the head still at, at that time. And the AIDS Law Project used law to try to create a legal framework uh, that, that, that was non-discriminatory of people living with HIV. We developed a charter on, of human rights and, and HIV, and we used litigation. In 1998, we had a, a groundbreaking case which we brought against South African Airways because they were refusing to employ people living with HIV as cabin attendants. Uh, and people said to us, don't take that case. You'll never win that case. You know, everybody thinks nobody wants to be served on a plane by a person living with HIV. That was the level of, of stigma and prejudice. And we won that case. Eventually, it went to the Constitutional Court and we got a very, very powerful, profound judgment about discrimination and st stigma and not condemning people to economic death. Uh, that was the language of the court because of HIV infection. But Cardinal, you know, as you know, law is one thing. Law doesn't change behavior. So we had to have another campaign 
uh, that was led by the Treatment Action Campaign to try to destigmatize HIV. And as you can see, you know, this we we launched the Treatment Action Campaign in 1998 so on Human Rights Day, 1998. And we launched it very quickly. We developed this T-shirt, which became like our uniform, which was part of a strategy to destigmatize HIV and to say to people, if you have HIV, I'm going to be open about it. If you don't have HIV, understand what it's like to live with HIV in order to feel the discrimination and, and, and stigma. So it required various different strategies to run simultaneously. And as you know, as an activist, you know, you don't end the problem like this, even today. You know, we, we, we now, exactly. as you said, 40 years since the start of the epidemic, we still live with stigma and discrimination, not at the same extreme level, but the problem is still there. Thanks, Mark. I think that T-shirt was so iconic and remains iconic for many of us. And so many future health battles actually on the back of that t-shirt. Uh, you know, the message has always changed at the back, but the HIV yeah. positive stayed in front, and, and that was a message that came to us in many other countries as well. Uh, your South African Airways case was quoted by us in, in anti-discrimination cases over here, so path-breaking at, at, at so many levels. But I think the other thing that sort of emerged uh, over the years of working on HIV mark for, for many of us was that what we really realized was it wasn't the virus. The virus was a true marker of inequality. What it showed us was the gaps in society, those who had been marginalized either by law or by social norms. When you saw who was vulnerable to it, when you saw who was most deeply impacted by it and who's, which community suffered the brunt uh, of the pandemic. And you see that even till today, uh, whether it's in the developed world or in the developing world. Uh, 2021 is, uh, is it's an interesting landmark. It's not just 40 years of, of you know, the first documentation of the cases. It's also 20 years of the first UN General Assembly special session on a health issue. It had never happened before, and it was on HIV. Uh, and all our governments meet every five years since then to uh, agree to you know, national solidarity, commitments, goals, targets to sort of move towards addressing the pandemic or what is now called you know, ending AIDS. Um, and I think that is really a, a place where so many activists have tried to push in the idea that if you don't deal with the violation of rights, if you don't deal with inequality, you're not going to meet these targets and goals. Uh, we just had uh, the UN high level meeting for 2021 on HIV in the last two weeks. And I was wondering what you thought of the outcomes of it and where do you think we really are in recognizing inequality as a driver of pandemics? Well, you're absolutely right, of course. Um, in fact, you know, yesterday, I, these days, uh, one of my jobs is to be the editor of a publication called Maverick Citizen, which is a social justice platform, human rights platform. And, and yesterday I, I wrote an editorial that was titled something like ending COVID means ending AIDS and ending AIDS means ending inequality. Yeah. And inequality underlies AIDS, it underlies non-communicable diseases, it underlies COVID. Uh, uh, inequality is perhaps the greatest determinant of health and of access to healthcare services. And sometimes you feel like governments don't learn this most fundamental of lessons that we will not stop pandemics. Uh, well, well, you might be able to stop them for rich people, but for poor people, these pandemics, these viruses, will continue to run rife and cause suffering and, and, and loss. And so, you know, my, my question is, uh, and what I wrote in this editorial was to say, where's the plan to end inequality? Mm -hmm. You know, the targets that UNAIDS has set for 2025 are bold uh, to the numbers of deaths, I think cut the number of deaths to 250,000 a year, cut the number of infections to 370,000 a year, you know, Kajal, with your and my memories that go back 25 years, 30 years on that, that that's radical. We would never have dreamt that we could have got that close. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, it's progress. But on the other hand, uh, um, you know, you won't get there without dealing with this, this inequality. And what scares me is that COVID has just made inequality a great deal worse. Uh, again, you know, I saw something by the World Bank yesterday. 150 million more people pushed into extreme poverty as a result of COVID-19. In South Africa, we've lost 
three million jobs. The people who've borne the brunt are women, just as women bore the brunt of and continue to bear the brunt of, of HIV. So what's really maddening is, is that we know all of this and we don't act on knowledge. You know, in the early days of the HIV epidemic, when I used to write on it, one of the quotes I used to, to use time after time was from some sociological research that was published, I think in about 1992 or 1993. So way before the HIV, when there was still time to stop HIV in South Africa. And these researchers pointed out to the fact that HIV epidemic had really started in amongst mine workers or what were the first groups of people where the ep epidemic began mm. uh, because of the conditions of mine workers, because they were migrant workers, because they lived in hostels, away from families, away from communities. And it pointed out that the epidemic would move from mine workers to sex workers because sex workers worked in those communities and through sex workers into larger communities back into the areas where people come from. And that was exactly the path that the epidemic followed. So, you know, knowing that social science, we could have stopped it and we didn't stop it. And, and now as we sit here today in South Africa, you know, we've had three and a half million deaths due to HIV.